Our preaching text this morning is from the Epistle Lesson, chapter 10, verse 5. When Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. A body you prepared for me. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, as we come to you this morning, we come to you anticipating the great celebration of the mystery of the Word made flesh, that the Word took upon Himself a body, a body the psalmist said you prepared for Him, the one you spoke about in your scroll. Help us as we think about this meaning of the incarnation, the enfleshment of the Word, to understand what our texts are saying to us this day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, as we looked at the story of Last week's text, John the Baptist, to help us think about it, we took an ancient, not ancient, old Christmas story that's very popular even to this day, and we looked at it through the lens of that story, the Christmas Carol, the story of Ebenezer Scrooge. This week I want to do the same thing. I want to look at the story through the lens of, a, of another Christmas story, but not one that's as old as the Christmas Carol, which is from the 1800s. It's still older than I am. I, I wasn't alive when this story was first told, but most of us have heard of it. And the reason why I think stories like this one and the story of the Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens continue to uh, have a popularity is because they speak the truths about this season in a way that people can understand. And the story I'm speaking about today may be a surprise to some of you because it's a modern story and it may not seem to really fit exactly with the text, but I think as we think about it, we'll see that it does. And I'm speaking this morning about the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, a movie that continues to speak to people so much so that right now you can go to Showplace Cinema South and they're showing it on the big screen and they're anticipating that people will come out for a movie that was put out in the 40s or 50s or whenever it was. I know it takes place kind of culminates in the 40s just after World War II is brought to an end. And uh, people will go and see it because it has, I believe, actually the message of today's text told in a way that people can understand. And it resonates as true. That's why I said, why is it that Ebenezer Scrooge can be told again and again and again and again? Because it resonates as true. And I believe this story resonates as true. So I'm going to tell the story, but I'm going to tell it differently. I'm going to start at the back at the end, where it climaxes, where it, it, the story comes to a close. And the story comes to a close with George Bailey, a man who's gone through a very stressful time, as we'll get into in a moment, a, a time of great pressure, a time of great testing, a time when he was even tempted to take his own life. And he's at the end of that story, and the story's coming to its happy climax, and he's standing by a Christmas tree, not unlike this one, and he opens up a book that he finds there, and inside, written on that book, is a message from an angel that he had been with recently, a strange angel by the name of Clarence, a kind of a funny-looking angel. In fact, uh, George said at one point, kind of a fallen angel, aren't you? You know, he was kind of thinking, this guy isn't really an angel. But the man said to him something that I think resonates with all of us. He says, George, you had thought... He doesn't go into this kind of detail, but this is the summary of it. You thought your life was a failure. Because all your life you had dreamed that you would be doing these or that things. But what he wrote in there was, no man is a failure who has friends. And what he was saying to him is that if you love and are loved, then you have realized in a very deep way your reason for being. And that if you love and have loved, it doesn't matter if you've not made all of these things happen in your life that you dreamed would happen. You have realized the one thing that is needful. Think about it. We don't always live in times and in periods when you can realize all of the potential that we can realize today. We live in a time when we have a great economy for, for the most part. We live in a very stable society, a very ordered society. We have the opportunity to fulfill all kinds of dreams. But you go back into different periods in history, not even that far back in our own history, especially you go back to the Depression. I've known many people who lived through the Depression. They were not able to live out the dreams that they had thought they could live out for their lives. It just wasn't possible. But what the message of that story is, is that there is one thing that is needful. And that one thing that is needful, the one thing you need to do to fulfill your destiny, your purpose, your reason for being, is to love and be loved. And the message of that story is, is that George had done that, at least to a small degree. None of us, as we will say in our confession of sin, lives that out perfectly. We all have sinned by not loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, or our neighbor as ourselves. We can realize it to certain degrees. And Clarence was saying, 
You've done so much, you just don't know it. You have this gift, the gift of the purpose why you're, you're on this earth. And people deep down know that if they have loved and been loved, truly have loved and been loved, they know deep down that they have fulfilled their being. And so they know something real about this universe. That at the heart of this universe is love. Isn't that amazing? People know it. They know that, that to fulfill their humanity is to express and to receive love. And that that is something objective and real and true. And what does that tell us already about the universe? Because to love and be loved is to be personal and to be interpersonal. And so it tells us that behind the universe, behind the reality in which we live, there must be something personal. Why else would the universe climax in that way for us human beings and that we find our fulfillment in love if it is not that the universe was created by one who is love? And then already then we have the beginnings of the doctrine of the Trinity because how can one be loved unless he has loved and is loved? And that is the doctrine of the Father and of the Son loving each other and the fulfillment of that love emanating in this reality we call the spirit of love, which is the Holy Spirit shed abroad in our hearts. But of course, in order to have love, you have to have persons. That's what I just said. It has to be interpersonal. And in order for it to be personal... There has to be freedom, freedom to go the wrong way, freedom not to fulfill your destiny. And so the power behind the universe that is love, the Bible says the power behind the universe is love, in love, took a risk and made a world where people can go wrong. And that's, of course, Mr. Potter, right? He is the personification of the life gone wrong. Because rather being, than being ordered towards love as his highest good, Rather than being ordered towards love as the fulfillment of his being, he's ordered towards money, power, and domination. And of course, we see in his life the effects of that. He's a, he's a as George himself would say, a warped, frustrated old man. Someone who has not been able to live out his destiny, and he's the personification extreme in the same way Ebenezer Scrooge is, is of a life that's been gone wrong. But of course, if we're all honest, like I said last week, there's an old Ebenezer Scrooge in all of us, an old Adam and old Eve, and in all of us there's a Mr. Potter. Now, the Christian believes that there's always a fundamental ambiguity to every human person. Every human person is a mixture of good and of bad. I believe, perhaps, for example, in the doctrine of total depravity, but total depravity does not mean every human being is as bad as they could be. It just means every part of them is affected by badness. And that in every person, no matter how bad they get, there's still something about things in their life that reflect that goodness and that beauty and that truth that is God. We're all a mixture of a George Bailey and of a Harry or of a Henry. I can't say Harry Potter with the with the, with the books. <laughs> so close. It's Henry Potter, Henry F. Potter. There's some of that in all of us. And so we have in the story. This, this man, Potter, and what does Potter want to do? He wants to take away this building and loan. This, this means by which George has actually been sowing the seeds of love, as we'll talk about in a moment. And then, of course, there's in his life this man, Uncle Billy, who's not really the guy you really should be having working with money. I mean, he's this forgetful guy, and he's been given the responsibility of depositing $8,000. I went back to the Bureau of Labor Statistics to see what $8,000 in 1945 money would mean today. Because we say $8,000, anyway, just go talk to someone, you get the money. No. In our dollars, $8,000 in 1945 today is worth $113,275.51. So roughly $114,000 he was trusting with this scatterbrained Uncle Billy. So you can kind of question George's judgment there. I don't know. But he goes and he, uh, he interacts with he uh, Henry Potter and he accidentally leaves the $8,000 in Potter's lap. And Potter, being the greedy, miserly, power-hungry man that he is, sees that he has the money, fails to, to give it back uh, to, to uh, Billy. In fact, he sees this is my chance to finally bring down the one competition I have in this town that is keeping me from the power, the money, the control, the prestige that I want. I can destroy George Bailey because basically he's got $114,000 shy. That's a big... Now you understand why he's saying it's jail, it's scandal, it's horrible. I'm $114,000 shy basically in today's money. 
And George being the man he is, he's not going to give Billy up. He's thinking he's going to take the rap himself and go to jail. And that's when he begins to wonder about his own life and to think about taking his life. Now, there's an interesting uh, 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 plot twist on this, at least uh, one that has been suggested uh, by Saturday Night Live. You know, because one of the things that gets to us in this story, well, let's, let's go to the next part of the story. Of course, we know, if you know the story, the reason why it climaxes the way that it does is because George realizes that all the seeds of love he's been sowing, and let's think about the seeds of love he's been sowing. It goes back to when he was just a young man and he was getting ready to leave to travel to see Europe and to do the things that he was wanting to do. And he went into that boardroom where they were arguing with his dad and he said to Potter, these rabble you're talking about, these people who are these working class people, uh, that they do most of the living, the dying, the working in this town. What is wrong with them having a couple of nice rooms and a bath? And he identifies with them in their need. Here we're getting a little glimpse of what love is, and especially what the Christmas story of love is. George identifies with them in their need, and they know it, right? And so they experience from George what love. Love is interpersonal communion. At the heart of our faith is communion. We say we believe in the communion of the saints, that we're interconnected, and this interconnection happens as we identify with the other person, as we bear... That's why Paul says, if you want to be the Christian community, he says to the Galatians, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of being that is the Christ. If you want to fulfill what Christ is, you bear one another's burdens and you know what love is. Love is interpersonal communion that bears the burden of another person. And George had been sowing those seeds all those years. And when they found out that he was $114,000 shy, they didn't question it. They knew his heart. They knew who he was. And they knew that wasn't him. And they took it upon themselves as a collective community to bear his burden. And they come in and they're funny scenes with people bringing every last dime they have. They're, they're one maid. She says, I was saving up my money in case I got married, just in case then I get a divorce. And she dumps it all out there as a way of saying, every last penny, George, I'm giving to you. Another friend, Sam Wainwright, who had made it really big and was living in New York, said he would forward $25,000. I calculated that in today's money. That would have been $353,000 in today's money. So you can see that it was this overwhelming response to them. Which brings us uh, uh, to where I'm going with this. One of the things that has always frustrated people about this story, however, is that's how it ends. It ends without anything ever happening to Potter, right? He basically gets away with it. He gets away with at least having that $8,000 and he never has accountability. And there's this inner sense of is this what love is? Is love a, a universe wherein people uh, can get away with it? And there's a funny uh, Saturday Night Live sketch from the late 1990s when Dana Carvey was on there, and it says, the ending that should have happened. And I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they find out he's got the $8,000, and they go over, and they, there's paybacks. <laughs> and, and it's kind of like, finally, there's some justice in the world. But that brings us to the meaning of Christmas because people sense that love is not love if things do not get judged. Mary is lifted up in our, our gospel lesson today as someone whose heart is right with God. And what does she celebrate about the Messiah? She celebrates about the Messiah that in his love he does not let injustices go by. His mercy extends to those who fear him, she says. He's brought down rulers from their thrones. He's lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. The Bible is filled with an idea that you cannot have love unless you have justice. And this is the, the part of the story of It's a Wonderful Life that's missing. It's interesting in the Bible when it tells us not to seek revenge. It doesn't say, it doesn't matter. Don't seek revenge. No, it says, do not seek revenge. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. You see, the Bible holds two things in tension here. Number one, God is love. But true love does not let injustices go unjudged. And God says, you're not to have revenge and seek revenge on other people. 
but I will repay. But that brings us to the, the great mystery of Christmas. Because when it comes right down to it, I said all of us are somewhat Henry Potters, right? And that means all of us are sinners, right? And that means all of us have not loved all of our neighbors as we should. We've failed to fulfill the law of love. And so the righteous judgment of God is not just on those people. It's not just on Henry Potter. It's on us. God's hatred of sin is on us. But that's where the story of love comes in because he says the sacrifices of bulls and of animals, you're not pleased with those because they can't undo the problem. They can't take away my just judgment. But a body you've prepared for me. And how does it climax in that text? It climaxes in our text for today by saying that in that body prepared for him, he, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Do you see what he was saying is that something had to be done, justice had to be served. So God comes and demonstrates love by identifying with us in our sin and becoming the place where God can pour out his judgment on us and we can be safe. You know, none of us is going to escape judgment. But we can receive that just judgment of God against our sin in Jesus Christ. And when we're baptized, God pronounces judgment upon us and he says, I kill the old David. The old David gets right now as it's being buried and drowned in the waters of baptism what it deserves. It deserves death. But because David is getting what he deserves in and through Jesus Christ, what would have been my destruction becomes my liberation. And I experienced freedom from the old David, the old Ebenezer, the old Henry Porter, that I might live more and more into the new Ebenezer, into the new George Bailey, into the new life of love. And so the Bible says we love because he first loved us. We identify with other people in their sins because he identified with us. We forgive, Jesus said, because we have been forgiven and we've been set free. And that is how we know what love is, John says. We know what love is because God loved us so much that he identified with us. And our communion, our fellowship is with the Son and with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts. Amen.